welcome to the OmniTalk Fast Five, sponsored by Fast Sensor and Takeoff. Today is January 6, 2021. It is our first podcast of the year, and I am your host, Chris Walton, and I am joined, as always, from sunny Florida by Ann Mazinga. I feel like a field reporter. Like, this is excellent. Yes. Live, you in, live in Florida. Yeah. You look live in Florida with that, like, geode picture behind you. It's, it's so, totally apropos. I love it. And then in the dark, dark state, garden state of New Jersey, of course, the always infamous Emma, the intern. Emma, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. It's actually very sunny outside, despite what it looks like in my room. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's, it's, it's nice and cheery outside. That's good. I can't say the same thing here in Minneapolis, where it's dark, dreary, and there's snow on the rooftops across from me as I look out the window. But Anne, you've been down in Florida for a couple of weeks, you know, give yes. the loyal listeners the update. How How's it going down there? Mr. Omnitalk getting some golf in? What's what's all happening? You know, yeah, it's been fantastic down here. It was a quite needed escape of uh, 2020. So it's been wonderful. But man, uh, I have to say, coming from Minneapolis to the opposite end of the country, uh, we couldn't, there couldn't be more differences. It's just, it's really eye-opening, I have to say, uh, with everything that's been going on and stores like we've made a couple yeah. store trips like it feels very different down here nothing's going on like people are business as usual enjoying the sunshine so it it's yeah I don't even know how to quite describe it I'm fascinated every day by just how different um, it's been and I think it's been a good experience overall too especially yeah, for us as we're thinking about yeah, it's been a crazy two weeks. I mean, it's been two weeks since I think we've done this. And, you know, God, look at all that's happened. I mean, democracy didn't fall. I mean, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. It's Thursday. We still have democracy. Woo, woo, raise the roof on that one. And, and I got to tell you, I look more relaxed just looking at you. Like, yeah. looking at you right now, if you're watching, it's like it's like one of those sand gardens that I can just run a small little lake <laughs> through on my desk. Oh my that's God. how I feel looking at you right now. But Emma, you got school started. When, what's, what's the deal with second semester grad school at the University of Minnesota? I mean, you're still in Jersey. What, when are you coming back? Coming back next week, and then school picks up the week after that. It's all online, you know, business as usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna. That seems like how it's gonna be. I think for a lot of us here going in. But uh, I, I think we've got a fun show. I think it's gonna be a fun show. You know, it's the early part of the year, so the headlines are always a little bit different. But sometimes, with if you if you're a loyal follower of our show, the Omni Talk Fast Five sometimes has a ton of fun and brings some really interesting insights on the weeks where the headlines are a little bit off kilter from what they usually are. So this week we've got a lot of good things to cover. We've got. Macy's announcing a new chief merchant. We have Afterpay's sizzling holiday sales figures that we're going to discuss and especially get Emma the intern's take on that one. We've of course got the latest in all that is Amazon's news. And then we are going to end with a feature we are calling, do we care if they go away? Yes, wait for it guys. Do we care if they go away in 2021? We're gonna have a blast with that. But first we have to talk a little J C P and I don't know about you guys, but this was like my first dose of reality back to the real world was this headline when it came through. I think it was just Sunday night before um, everybody came back from their holiday hangovers on Monday, but JC Penney's, uh, their new owners, uh, if you've forgotten over the holiday, Simon Property Group and Brookfield, they announced that they have launched a search for a new chief executive officer to replace Jill Soltow, who will be leaving today, actually Thursday, January 7th. So uh, not, not a lengthy exit there. It is one and done for Jill Soltow. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the first thing that I thought of when I read this headline was, do you think JCPenney's will last long enough for this new CEO search? Because in the interim, That's they're going to really have- That's a question. They're going to have- <laughs> Uh, Stanley Sashua as the interim CEO, um, who is the Simon chief investment officer. But I'm like, man, how long do we got for this search guys? Like we'll get into it in, in the fifth story of this, but I don't know. And it brings up other questions too, which I think we'll talk about for me after story number two, but, but what do you guys think of this? Was so it even a big deal to you? You're short on this. Yeah. I got to let Emma go first. Cause I have a feeling like the two, first two stories here, I'm going to go on some massive rants, like just get right into like full on Chris Walton here in 2021, the first oh show God. of the year. But Emma, what do you think of this? 
I mean, I read the headline and I was like, yeah, whatever, and just scrolled past it. I think like there's so much more that needs to be done for JCPenney than like switch the CEO. And I really think they need to hire from outside. Don't necessarily take someone who just has that standard CEO of a big company kind of background. Like do something crazy. Hire someone who might actually have the potential to change the direction of this company. Yeah, I think that's it. I got a question from the listener actually on this one earlier in the week. Like, do either of you guys think that there was anything she could have done? No. And Emma, you're saying no. Emma, the intern says no. Like, it's just a lot. You just think it's a lost cause. And what do you think? Well, yeah, I, mean, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, she tried to, it was interesting. I read um, something that she said in an earnings call back in 2019 and, you know, they waffled so much back and forth, like, who's our target demographic? We're going to go after millennial moms in 2016. And Jill Soltel came back in in 2019. And she's like, no, our, our target guest is the shopping enthusiast who loves mall shopping and already makes purchases at JCPenney. Which when I hear that crap, I'm just like, you're done. Yeah. Right. The shopping exactly. enthusiast. I hate that stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that, no, she, there wasn't anything that she, she was going to be able to do, especially in two years. And now it's just become more of an important thing for Simon and Brookfield to be watching out for because all of their mall leases are dependent on this JCPenney staying open. And if it yeah. closes and then, then they have this like ripple effect of other yeah, issues. Huge. So yeah, it's a bandaid for now. And I, yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of the same, you're kind of feeling the same way. I mean, here's my, here's my take on this. Like, and I found some interesting stats, which I think just shed a little bit of a different light on this story too. So I went to, um, I think it was salary.com, which I don't know if, if you know that website, but I just looked it up. I just did a search. What did Jill Saltel make in, you know, 20, I think it was these, these numbers were from 2019. So her first year on the job. Okay. So they're a little bit old, but uh, you'll get the point. I don't think it matters. She made, wait for it, and an Emma the intern, $9.7 million in total compensation in 2019. What Where does point? that stack? Like, do you yeah. have, they ship? Go ahead. That's a great question, Ann. I actually okay. happen to have that data. Thank you. $1.4 million of that was salary. You know, just $1.4 million in salary. Okay. This is interesting. $4.5 million was in bonus compensation. Hmm. Okay. For, for a job well done in 2019. And then $3.75 million was in stock. And the residual, give or take about $100,000 if you're doing the math at home, which hopefully no one is, is, you know, probably mostly like healthcare benefits and things like that. So we're talking almost $10 million. We paid somebody $10 million. The shareholders paid somebody $10 million to do a job that we just said probably wasn't even doable. So why the hell does that keep happening? And so that's my point here. And we called this in 2018. We said this hire stunk from the beginning. I mean, look at LinkedIn. Her background was she was the CEO of Joe Ann Fabrics. How is that the person that is qualified to turn JC Pennies around? She wasn't the one to do it. And even if she was, like, it's probably not something that could be done. So why do we pay $10 million to someone to accomplish something that can't be done? It's over, I'm out. I'm done. At this point, it just feels like an executive pay party. It has since they made the announcement in 2018. It just feels like an executive pay party. Let's make certain people get richer, richer off of this as JC Penney's goes downhill. God knows what the fallout is from there. But I think numbers like that, honestly, they just make me sick because she's not $10 million better than somebody else. Okay, my rant's over. Anything you'd add there, Anne? What do we, I guess my other question that I was asking earlier was what what is a comparable CEO of like Macy's? What's the CEO of Macy's making? Like, oh, I'm sure he's Jeff making more than that. I'll try to look it up as we're doing the conversation okay. here, but I'm sure it's way, I'll go to salary. And, and, I would, yeah. and I would be willing to guess that her salary isn't that high based on JCPenney's stock and how much it's valued in the last two years. Oh too. God, it, relatively speaking, actually, it could be really highly paid relative to that value. I'll, I'll try to look that up too, in terms of seeing what the current market cap is, if it's even calculable. Well, no, because I aren't in bankruptcy. So anyway, but all right, let's move on. Story number two, which is, I'd say, germane and a good segue here. Macy's has replaced its chief merchant after just two years. So on Monday, Macy's announced that Nadadvir, hope I'm saying that correctly, senior vice president and general business manager, formerly for beauty and center core merchandise, will be the new chief merchandising officer at Macy's effective February 1st. 
For those that remember, she replaces what was previously a 35-year Macy's veteran, Patty Onkman, who was promoted to the post, as I said, about two years ago. Vere began her career at Macy's as a trainee about 15 years ago. And let's have you go first. What are your thoughts on this as I try to quickly look up Jeff Gannett's compensation? So here's the deal. If I was Jeff Gannett and I was sourcing a new chief merchant and I'm sourcing that merchant internally, I don't think that Nata is a bad option. She is working on one of the categories that's probably the most promising. And I would argue one of the only reasons to still go to a Macy's, which was beauty. I mean, they still have some of those cachet beauty brands. She, I, I read kind of up does on that, her. That doesn't by default make you a good candidate though. I don't know. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I would say she's young and she also she's might young. have some more progressive ideas. She did work a lot on really taking and sourcing new partnerships for food and for beauty um, for Macy's. And so I think that she, she could be the right person internally um, to help revitalize that. But like we're talking about with Jill Solta, like I don't know that she's set up for success either. And being the chief merchant of Macy's as an entity versus being the merchant of redefining the beauty category inside Macy's, like those are very different jobs. And Really, for me, ultimately, I think it comes down to the bigger question of what do you do with the Macy's and JCPenney customers? And so what same, same is, kind of conversation we were having before. Exactly. Like, what do you do there? Both of, both of these customers, you know, everybody's writing about how, you know, this is all of these customers are now going to Kohl's or to off-price places. I would argue that most of these customers are going to Costco even. Like, that has to be thrown into this yeah. equation, too. And when you start to think about, you know, the, that boomer audience that is the core customer that Jill Soltal defines, they are, you have to figure out how you're going to still capture that customer because there is still value in their money. They have disposable income. How, how are you going to reimagine this? And I just don't know that that's some capable of being done inside the old JCPenney's and Macy's mindset. Mm -hmm. I think within the mindset, you're right. But I, I do, I, we've always said from day one on the show, there's a way to reimagine the department store. Now, I don't think JCPenney's could do it. I'm not sure Macy's can do it. The, the idea of the department store itself is dead, but there's a way to reimagine the usage of that anchor space in a department store. That's why I think some of the connections with Amazon have, were so interesting in the you know summer part of this year. But I, I, I don't know, I'm going to say this, Disclaimer, I don't know her at all. I've never met her. I have no opinion on her. The thing that I think is interesting about this, though, is that this doesn't seem on paper like the right hire. You, you mentioned she's young. For sure she's young. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. But it does mean you have less experience. And her experience is almost solely, solely inside of Macy's. So as the person that's going to transform Macy's in one of the most important jobs in that company, likely going to come from Macy's given everything we've talked about on the show for the last few years? I don't think so. And here's the other thing that bothers me about this hire. If you look at LinkedIn, every job she's held, she's held for under two years. That's important to think about. It's always easy to anniversary somebody else's work, but the proof is in the pudding in year three when you anniversary yourself. And when you haven't held a job for longer than that, I start to wonder about how that plays out in the long run. And I know you disagree, but here's, or you're thinking about something, but here's the thing. The key ingredient for success, in my opinion, is learning agility. It's the ability to succeed in first order conditions, given everything that's new and changing in your dynamics. And so when you're changing jobs that much and your experience is solely inside of one space, I think that becomes a very problematic thing to accomplish and to do well. And so it makes me wonder, quite frankly, how big, two things, how big of an external scan was done by Macy's, which is, again, to me, a signal more of, of, of Jeff and the CEO there, or was one even done at all? Because yeah. I had to think there'd still be a lot of people that would be interested in this challenge. And last word, what do you think? I have a hard time with that criticism, Chris, because I think if you look at any major retailer, throughout the past 15 years, the whole setup was you spend 18 months in a job and you move on. Like that's how legacy retail was set up. So I don't know that you can- No, that's, I, that's, I think that's inside the box target talk there. I think that that's how Target was. That's not how all retail has always been. 
And that's always, I think if you talk to good hiring managers, him, so but something legacy you do look him. for on a res, that's something you do look for on a resume, how long you've been in position, have you seen your own, have you seen the fruits of your own successes? Have you seen the failures too, and had to figure your way out of them, which I think is a really important thing when you start mm-hmm. talking about like Macy's and what they're up against. So I don't know on paper, she could be great. I'm not saying that on paper, I just wondered how much due diligence was put into this which again is an indictment more on how they're going about this whole process. For sure. I, I agree. Uh, I, I mean, like I said, I think it, it stems from what are the larger issues that Macy's and JC Penney's and all these legacy department stores are facing. But I mean, this is an opportunity. I mean, if you were her, would you yeah. take this job? Oh, hell yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, right? Christ, so, I mean, it's a great job to consider. I think anybody should consider it. And yeah, and here's like we say all the time, whenever we make, you know, pointed critiques or criticisms, prove us the hell wrong, man. Get out there, turn this shit, turn this thing around. And like, let's be talking about that because that would be the best thing for so many people and a really great thing for retail. All right, let's move to story number three. Emma, you got this one. All right. So installment payments firm Afterpay reported a 30% increase in its average basket size for U.S. customers year over year during this holiday season. So these users access the platform online and in physical stores. And then interestingly, the most popular products included thermal knits, socks and pajamas from Old Navy, Crocs and fleece line boots and slippers. So I think this story makes sense. It's obvious that I think more and more people are trying out installments and whether you were strapped for cash this holiday season, living paycheck to paycheck, or I think this is also a great time for people if they're gonna try out Afterpay or a similar company, you might as well do it for the holidays. I am kind of, I think it's definitely interesting that people are purchasing from Old Navy because I normally think of using these installments for like a really big right. purchase. So I can only imagine how many products they're buying from Old Navy and Crocs and all these things. But yeah, I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Yeah, I have a question. This came from one of the listeners too, or earlier in the week as I was talking to different people. Emma, how do you think about this first? Because I know Anne has some like skepticism on this story. Anne's like Miss Skeptic today, actually. I'm noticing Doctor. like- as we go here. Yeah. Um, are you buying like this big increase, like 30%? Because the interesting thing, when you think about that, like, I'm curious, how do you interpret this? Like, are people, they're essentially paying 30% more if the basket size is going up to then pay on installment. So net net, are they saving money or spending more money by going on installments? And then therefore, is all this about installment payments or is there like other stuff going on? Like Emma, how do you think about that first? That's a really interesting question. Definitely. There's a lot of skepticism about paying in installments and whatnot, but I think to me, this headline means that people just put more items in their cart or spent more in total, or they're going to be spending more in total. And I can't say for sure, I'm not entirely sure of the policies of Afterpay, but I mean, if they have a big interest rate on there, then yeah, you're gonna be paying more in the long run. But lots of these companies don't actually charge that much interest. But I think lots of people don't understand these kind of services because they're not living paycheck to paycheck. Like until you're really in that mindset, I don't think this makes sense. But when you are that kind of person, it's just a logical way to split up how you buy things. Well, yeah, and then the other, I think the counter that too is also if, if you are, using these and then you're like, well, now I can start spending more because I just am spending what I normally spend and deferring that, that becomes problematic somewhere down the line. So well, it, especially with the holidays, like you, yeah. you're not even counting, like this is not a normal time period. This is holidays where people are, get desperate to make holidays great for their kids and their families. And so I think that if I don't have to, right. if I'm not limited to what I have, you know, in my hand pocketbook right now and I can defer that payment or spread that payment across the next you know six months versus just trying to do and scrape by with whatever I can in the month of December Mm -hmm. I think that that like Emma's saying you know if you're living paycheck to paycheck that opens up some options for you my number one problem with this is that I think honestly anything that you're going to tell me right now year over year compared to 2020 is complete BS. Like, I don't even want to look at it because 2020 was not a year that you can deliver a comp for. Like, it, there, it's way too much were outside of the control. 30% increase in baskets, sure, but how many more people were buying things online because they weren't going in store and then after pays an option where they're not seeing right, that firsthand when right, they're going right. into Old Navy on Black Friday and, you know, spending all the money like they were on the doorbusters there. Like, 
It's just a totally different mindset. However, I think yeah. that net net, it's something that retailers from independent retailers to the larger retailers out there need to have a plan for because Afterpay or Sezzle or any of these other companies are becoming as ubiquitous as free shipping. And so it's something that you're going to need to be prepared for when you start to look at your e-com strategy for the next year and beyond. I could not agree more with you, Anne. Yeah, after our last little tete-a-tete -tete we had there on the Macy's story, I couldn't agree more. It reminds me of something I think I learned watching the French Open as a kid one time. I don't remember if it was Bud <laughs> Collins or John McEnroe who said it, but you're never as good as you think you are and you're never as bad as you think you are. And that's what this is. Like, I think, I don't think these numbers are as good as Afterpay is trying to make them out to be, but I think there is something in the trend here of buy now, pay later as a thing. And we've been on that trend for a long time. I and mean, we interviewed Sezzle back in 2018 and look how much they've exploded. Um, so I think that, you know, there's something there, but and your point, your point is right. Like we can't overinterpret these numbers. Like somebody was trying to drop that on Costco today about like, how Costco doesn't need to like do all these omni-channel capabilities because their business is doing so well. And, and you're right. Like half the department stores and malls are closed. So where the hell else are people going to go? Like there's just so many other factors at play here when you start putting those arguments into things that you can't control all the variables. But the other like fun little fact I thought of last night too, as I was researching this is like, you know, what we've never talked about for buy now, pay later pharmacy, drugstores, mm -hmm. like pay for your medications on installment. That could be huge. Like I got, oh, Walgreens fail, by the way, for everyone listening. <laughs> Walgreens for 24 hours has not been able to, to, um, to, to I have not been able to transmit a uh, delivery order. And I called them up, called their service line. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, system-wide issue, can't do anything about it. I'm like, gee, thanks. Fortunately, I don't need my medication like right away, but there's probably people that do who can't go into the store figure out a manual workaround and get a better customer service solve on that one Walgreens. And I know all the loyal listeners from CVS are probably pretty stoked that I'm saying that right now. But anyway, like, I think that's a big business too, that like people haven't even thought about or tapped into yet. Like, you know, prescription drugs can be hundreds of dollars. Like, all right, let's keep moving on that note. All right. So our fourth story for today, according to the Wall Street Journal, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan are ending their healthcare venture, Haven. Haven Health was an idea sparked from JP Morgan chief executive, Jamie Dimon, and supported by Amazon's Jeff Bezos and Berkshire's Warren Buffett. They were seeking to transform healthcare by reducing costs for hundreds of thousands of workers at their three companies by pooling resources and technology. Now, while I am very skeptical and tinfoil hat about Amazon getting into the healthcare industry, I was really disappointed to hear about this this week. I have to say, this was one of the ones that I'm like, man, there's nothing, they, they couldn't figure it out. Now, what I think that the problem was, if I'm going to break this down, and I've been reading a ton about it, is that it was probably too large scale an effort to tackle right away in my opinion, and we know Amazon's already working on it, Amazon is probably gonna have better success doing this internally within their own, with starting with their own employees, which they're already doing with their health hubs that they put around their manufacturing, or sorry, their uh, warehousing facilities. Um, and I think that if they go back to the drawing board and really start to figure out how they start to roll this out with employees in a better way, how they start to roll this out to prime members in a better way, I think that we'll see more success with Amazon truly trying to take over the healthcare uh, part of this. I, I don't think it's, it's a dead on arrival thing for Amazon. I think that they can, and maybe even Walmart and some other companies too, but I think this is not the end. It's just a, a restart and, um, you know, Amazon really focusing in on their own company and what, what they're able to control. The other thing that I think could be interesting is something to watch is as they're broadening into other industries like pharmacy, they, they recently rolled out. I think it's starting to look at the number of employees that they'll continue to bring on and other things like the affordable housing stuff that they're getting into, like what happens when you've created this entirely Amazon employee ecosystem where now you have healthcare, you have affordable housing, you have all these other components that they're providing you in and around your place of work. Like that kind of starts to, to blow my mind a little bit when you think about the possibilities of like 
a future employment with Amazon and what that looks like. But what do you guys think about this? Healthcare, can Amazon solve it? My hunch is like, you, what you said, those, those companies are just too big. They're probably like albatrosses around the neck of Amazon trying to figure this out. And Amazon can probably do it better and more efficiently on its own. And that's always been Amazon's ethos is to solve problems. I mean, there's the two pizza teams thing that always comes up, right? Like they never solve problems that way. Like let's go big and come down at it. They always start small and go up. And I think your point, Anne, is brilliant. Like, yeah, they're probably going to try to start with their own employees, create these hubs, a la like whatever we've seen with like, you know, the Pullman railroad cars back in the day is it like, just keep the, we've talked about that with Facebook before, keep the employees indebted to everything that's happening, figure out what they really like, then brought it out to the consumers, which is what Amazon's always done. And just, you know, seems like, it seems like a smart move. I'm actually kind of glad they're doing it because I think that might actually move even faster. So, all right, well, let's hit number five. So story number five, this, this is a segment we're calling do we care if they go away? Now, do we care can mean a lot of different things and it's purposely vague, but I think that the, the key thing here is, do we think for the most part, what the business model is of the retailers we're going to discuss, does it have a reason for being, does it have a place in consumers' hearts and minds, and therefore, do we care if it sticks around and should, do we hope and should it stick around? So the reason we're doing this, just in this last week, USA Today came out with a list of 21 retailers that they think could be in jeopardy. I'm sorry. They came out with a list of retailers for 2021 that could be in jeopardy of going away. So we're going to hit that list. We're going to have a little fun. Hopefully, you're, if you're watching on video, you're going to see lots of figures and hand gestures and movements. So we're going to rank them on a scale of one to three being one, don't care, three, we really care. We're gonna rank each of them and here we go. I'm gonna to try to do this as quickly as we can and have a little fun dialogue as we go along. All right, so let's hit the first one. Are you guys ready? Yes. All right. JC Petty's. One. Zero, and Emma goes zero, zero. All right, I think we hit that one pretty hard in the beginning. Macy's. One. I'm a one, two. All of us are ones. Okay. I think same reasons we've talked about that for a lot. Although I do think there's something that can be done there, like we've talked about. All right. Sears at Kmart. Zero. That's like, that's like, <laughs> like was, really? Like, do are they, they even still, register? Like, yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where does one it? find a Sears at yeah. Kmart anymore? Um, <laughs> Who's the next person? Oh, and by the way, Jeff, Jeff can. <laughs> Also made $10 million last year to answer that question. So oh. that's probably whoever the CEO of Sears is. Who knows what that guy's making. But Tuesday morning. One. You guys are one? one. I'm a two. I love Tuesday morning. Why are you guys one? I think I think they've got a good treasure hunt thing going. I don't understand why that can't work, mm. you know, in the right amount of stores, the right locations. What, what did you, what are you guys thinking there? I've never been there. <laughs> So you should disqualify yourself for voting. And <laughs> I think I think Treasure Hunt is fine, but they just don't have the awareness that the bigger players in the space, the Home Goods, the TJ Maxx's, have. I think getting crowded out, more online yeah. competition, more online evolution. I, okay, yeah. okay. Rite Aid. Oh, this yeah, is two. making weird I'm like, things. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm one and a half two. on this one. You're a two, Anne. Emma, you're a one. Emma, you yeah. probably know Rite Aid better than we do. Like, why one? You think so? Well, I mean, where you're located. That's true. I've never even seen a Rite Aid in Minneapolis, but we do have a ton of them out here. But they're always, they're so run down. I mean, why? They're always, there's always another pharmacy that's a better option. Like CVS and Walgreens are always cleaner, have better products. That's why I say one. You say one, yeah, and see who can get the digital capabilities faster, and they probably have deeper, bigger pockets to make that happen. That's a really good point. And what do you think? I said two. I mean, I think that they're still relevant in some of the smaller communities. They're they're close. They're you know they have for the most part pharmacies that can get people what they need quickly. They're trying some innovation things. So if they learn and can pivot quickly from those things, then I don't know. Let's see yeah. what happens. That's where I was too with the Walgreens fail that I talked about before. Like I think pharmacy and location is still such an important factor too. Like, so yep. I think that's something you have to consider. And the physicality of stores, I think, still matters in this business <laughs> to a greater degree and relative to the other business we've talked about. And so yeah, I was still kind of like one and a half too. All right. This one I think is going to be the biggest debate. Party City. Emma's uh, Emma's a one. I'm a three. What are you, Anne? I'm a two and a half. 
You're two and a half. Okay, yeah. you're two and a half. Yeah. All right, Emma, you're always you're always bringing it with like this the frank conversation. Why are you a one? I think this is going to be totally generational. Oh, I absolutely. I mean, I can't even think of a reason to go into Party City. I can get balloons at a grocery store. I don't, I have no reason that I can't get stuff for a party at the grocery store or a Target or Amazon. And what about your Halloween costumes, Emma, for all the parties you're going to? I feel like you're way, like, what happens when you can't find a costume and you decide to go to a party like last minute? Um, I'll tell you that the college students, they don't get their costumes at Party City. <laughs> That's not where they come from. <laughs> I once put a so, box over my head and a bandana and called myself pirated software when I was in college. But Anne, oh what do you, what, 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 why, why are you a two? I'm a huge three on this one, actually. I still think that this is a category that while I personally am like the least decorative type of person and I forget to, I like hand people gifts in plastic bags from the store that they came in. So I'm not the target demographic. However, I do think that there's still a need for, you know, kids. And when you have young kids for like those party favors and gifts, and until that stuff goes away, I think that there's still going to be a purpose for them. And I do, I still think that the Halloween thing is huge. And those Halloween businesses can survive for the entire year on being open for one yeah. or two months or whatever. So I still think that, that it's a viable business. 100% agree. I think it's a really hard business to do online. The dynamics of the cost of the items relative to the shipping costs. Lots of people have tried those like parties in a box businesses, but they've never really succeeded for the long run. They're hard to do for those reasons. I also still think you can make the shopping experience more omnichannel than it's been. It can be more fun, more inviting, more engaging, you know, more quote unquote experiential to use my favorite word in retail. But there's a lot of things that can be done there. I think, you know, by thinking about technology different and thinking about the in-store experience design differently too. And were you gonna say anything else? No, that's it. I'm, I'm already thinking about that, the next one. Oh, are you? Yeah. All right. Joe and fabrics. I'm a big two. Emma's a big two. Anne's a three, an okay three. Why are you a three on Joanne fabrics? Because I think you look at what happened during the pandemic. I think people had like a Joanne fabrics rebirth and now they like see the value. Michael's of too. Yeah. Same deal. Yeah, exactly. The value of crafts. They've been able to pivot. They went on Instacart and we're having home delivery for their products. Like I think it's still a very reliable business. The reason I'm laughing though, is because I was talking to my parents last night and, and going through this list and saying like, what do you guys think about these businesses to get the, the boomer perspective? And my mom was like, well, uh, I still have the 2021 coupon calendar for Joanne Fabric. So if they go away in 2021, Linda Mazinga is going to be knocking on the door. So I think Linda's that, still buying, uh, buying fabric by the yard, isn't she? She totally is. She totally is. That's yarn. That's She's a, been knitting. It's yeah, amazing. I mean, yes. Yeah. Like people have just found this love again of, of doing things with their hands and crafts. And yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I'm hanging on to Joanne. And again, you can't simulate that stuff online. Like it's, it's still hard to do that. There's still some physicality to that. All right. This next one, Neiman Marcus. I'm a two. Where are you guys? Two. We're all twos. Emma, this is your wheelhouse. You're more of the, of the, of the you're the more, you're the fashionista of the three of us. No offense, Anne. <laughs> I think Neiman no, Marcus, they definitely still have a place for like the luxury consumer and they're trying. They have a lot of work to do, but they're trying to be relevant and they have done a lot of kind of innovative things in terms of the pandemic. So putting it in at a two. Yeah, I still, there's some like, I feel like there's still some like kind of super upscale like super, super upscale department store thing you could do if you really got digital and omni-channel and your capabilities. I mean, Nordstrom's been trying to figure it out on their side and you know they're not on this list. So I, I've always felt that. Like I remember walking my first Neiman's experience with a buddy of mine in college who like had his own personal shopper and I was like, holy crap, this thing's really different. Like, I don't understand why that doesn't still exist in some way. It's not that different than what we talk about here locally, like the Martin Patrick experience, which is just smaller. Why do we think that's so great, but yet Neiman's can't do it on a bigger scale? Is that what you're thinking too, Anne? Yeah, I just think that there's a lot of opportunity for them to partner with some of these online first luxury platforms too. Like they have their physical store locations that I think could be of value to some of these digital digital only players. And yep. there could be some fun collaborations that are a possibility. Keep to keep, both do that, keep it fresh, going. keep it moving. Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. point. All right, this next few we'll move through quick because the last one I think is going to be a ton of fun. All right, Christopher and Banks. Yeah, I'm a I'm a one too. I think that one's that's gonna be a tough one. Jay Jill. 
one, one for all of us. Asino Retail Group, my favorite name for any retailer. One. We'll get into that in a later. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just so like like umbrella-ish, you know? It's just like, bleh. I don't know. It doesn't conjure inspiration for me. All right. Bed, Bath & Beyond. You guys are a one. See, I'm like, I'm like, I still think there's something you can do here. They had really poor earnings today, by the way. Stock dropped intensely, which by the way, we've been saying that for a while. Don't buy into the fact that you could turn this ship around in like six months. It can't happen. It takes at least two years to make this thing even pivot in a different direction. I've thought there's something could be done. I just think it's we've like we said before, I think it might be too late. All right. Express. I'm a big one on that. Yep, we're all a big one on that. All right, the last one. Victoria's Secret. How are you a one? We we had this whole discussion. You guys are one. We had this whole discussion. Emma, this might have Emma the intern. This might have been before you talk. We had this whole discussion about all that we would do to save Victoria's Secret to make it cool again. And you're a one. I'm like I'm decidedly a three. Like I think this still could be cool. It could be relevant. It could be something interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and say, course, but like, I'm gonna go ahead and say that when the two women who are the ones yeah, purchasing enough. from this place are saying one and you're saying your three, <laughs> oh, for sure. I do. I have plenty of ways that you could turn Victoria's Secret around. Yes, but do I care if it goes away now? No, I don't. I think that there's many, many other people and companies that are in a position to do this so much better. Like the, the Victoria's Secret model has just been on a significant decline you do. Who in the are last they? What do you think, who are those? You know, I think that um, you start to look at some of the other online first brands, like as they're starting to collect more information, they're starting to make more sizing available. Like Victoria's Secret, you still haven't figured out how to do a little bit better with sizing. Like th that's crazy. Like it's, it's just an old antiquated business run by a company or run by executives that I think uh, the next generation certainly is not going to be okay with. And yeah. there's just, it's, it's time for that to sunset. Um, yeah. People don't look to Victoria's Secret as the cachet brand that they used to anymore. I want to get Emma to take on this too, before we close the show. But the one thing I was thinking about though, with this is like the, you can mention these digitally native brands all we want. And I think people tend to over mention them because the still thing is they have still, they still are operating hundreds of stores. And so mm -hmm. they're still in a position to leverage their store asset base in a different way. So if they had the guts to reimagine or the, the guts and the faculties to reimagine themselves, that's an asset they have relative to those other people who haven't even learned how to do stores. So that's why I still think like I'm high on the scale with them to try to do it, but maybe you're right. Maybe they've lost, you know, so much of the ethos of who they are, but go ahead. You know where I'm high on this is if they, that sounds terrible, but where, <laughs> where I think could be an option for them is to sell express authentic brand groups, like half the brands we listed on this list to the Simon Properties and Authentic Brands Group, like move them online. There's definitely a market for it, especially like I would be, I would be curious to see what is actually selling at Victoria's Secret right now. Cause my hunch is that a significant portion of that is the pink and the love brands that are like yeah. the cheap, like it's not the, the luxury Victoria's Secret items anymore, but. Yeah, Emma, final word. I think Airy has mastered how to do comfort and fit. And then if you want your lingerie, there's so many other places that just do it better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking too, as you guys were talking, do some of the athletic brands start to get into this space a little bit differently too over the long run? Or am I like crazy thinking in, in that line? Well, like Lululemon and Athleta yeah. have already started to emerge yeah. into this, especially as like the definition, like let's not kid ourselves. When everybody went to athleisure this last year, like women aren't buying like super sexy, crazy right. lingerie anymore. Like we're, everybody's moving toward that comfort side of things too. So I think that that's going to cause a shift in, in our buying behaviors as well. Right. So that'll have a massive impact. Yeah. Great point. I hadn't thought about that prior to that conversation. That's why I love doing this show. You never know which corners you're going to go around and you always learn something new. At least I do. Hope, hope you do too. All right. That wraps us up. Happy birthday. Great birthdays today. Happy birthday today to Nicholas Cage, Jeremy Renner, and the woman who I will always know as Kate Summer from uh, Kate Summers, excuse me, also as someone who could speak more intelligently would say Kate Summers from Silver Spoons and Colonel Wilma Deering from Buck Rogers the great Aaron Gray. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it OmniTalk. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news 
And our twice week weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also features special content exclusive to us and just for you, all within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Some of what we said today might be right. Some of what we said today might be wrong, but what matters most is the conversation. Be careful out there. Today's OmniTalk Fast Five was brought to you by Fast Sensor. Fast Sensor is the first AI powered business intelligence platform that provides business owners with ROI focused optimization tools tailored to fit your organization. With Fast Sensor, you can successfully monitor safety, efficiency, and journeys across your organization from customer flow to queue management to the effectiveness of digital signage and promotions. Visit fastsensor.com to learn more. The OmniTalk Fast Five is also sponsored by Takeoff. Takeoff is transforming grocery by empowering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro-fulfillment, small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper-local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com.